here. Um, we're, I'm looking forward to a, a great day of, uh, of workshops, uh, and uh, we use the term workshops because we want to uh, we want to work, uh, we want to be able to interact, and uh, uh, these are, are not meant to be sessions where we deliver everything from the front. Uh, we want to be, uh, uh, want to have discussion. Uh, in this session, we'll have three presenters, and each one uh, will talk for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for, for discussion. To start, I'm going to welcome Leendert van Ostrom. Uh, Leendert is uh, from South Africa and uh, has been involved in in home education legal advocacy for many years and has fought many battles. Uh, Leendert uh, is a homeschool dad who's, uh, Leendert, you're done your homeschool journey personally, but involved in supporting others at this point. That's, and uh, so I'm gonna ask Leendert to come up and uh, what we wanna talk about here is, is what, what's involved in an organization doing political or doing a legal advocacy. Um, and uh, what, what does that look like? Uh, so we've got the United States, Canada, and South Africa that we'll be, we'll be talking. And just wanted to give you a picture of you want to take on as an organization doing legal advocacy uh, in your country, in your region. Uh, what are some of the things that, that these, these folks that have, that have done it, that have worked in it, and are working in it, what, uh, what kinds of things are they, uh, are they faced with and are challenged with and, uh, and be able to share that. So Leendert, welcome. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate your willingness to come. Leendert is associated uh, with the Petrolozzi Trust, which is the, the organization that raises the money and, uh, and then undertakes the, the funding of the work that needs to be done. So Leendert, welcome. Thank you, Gerald. <coughs> And good morning. Um, of the three presenters on this panel, uh, I'm the one who is not a lawyer. Uh, although I uh, was instrumental in establishing and operating uh, our Legal Defense Fund, um, I'm an educator. And before that, for 20 years, I was a naval officer. Um, <coughs> which means a lot of my approach tends to be of a military nature. Uh, <laughs> um, the reason why I am doing this job, which preferably should be done by a lawyer, is because certainly in South Africa, uh, there are no lawyers who are interested in uh, the law of education. And the reason for that is perfectly simple there's no money in it. So you need to get other people to collect the money and make it attractive to them. Uh, we have reached, I think, after nearly 20 years, the stage where we uh, would be able to carry a legal practice. Um, but we've learned since that it's actually very valuable to be able to pick the best lawyers for the best job uh, when you need it, uh, according to your needs. Um, so we might not go the way of actually selling ourselves to a legal practice. <laughs> so, um, So that is uh, where I come from. The Pestalozzi Trust was founded in 1998 and is finally more or less on even keel financially. Um, and it brings us to the point, uh, there are two ways, at least two ways, in which one could fund legal action. The one is the way HSLDA went about it, which was a, a lawyer with great vision who discovered that uh, if he were to continue giving free advice to homeschoolers, he would soon be bankrupt. So he uh, started a different model saying, okay, you guys pay me so much every year and I'll give you what uh, legal representation you need. Um, 
what we had to do for lack of lawyers with such vision in our country is we simply started collecting the funds and putting them aside for should we need it uh, in the event of legal conflict. Thank you. <clears throat> in the process, uh, even though you're not a lawyer, you tend to learn a lot about the law. And as um, Paul Farris has explained, the law on home education is a very uh, specialized field, very small, not many lawyers who know about it or who are competent at it. And so you soon find that it's possible for an educator uh, to become a specialist in that field to the extent that a school of law invites you to come and teach the subject to its senior students. Um, so both uh, models can work. Donkey Khan. Uh, I think for the startup, It's probably far safer if you can have a legal practice uh, standing by to take whatever cases you need. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if the adv advantage uh, persists later on when your funds become uh, reasonable. The next topic I'll be talking about is the place of legal advocacy in uh, legal action in advocacy, in other words, the need that homeschoolers have for teeth, what strategy to follow, offensive or defensive, and what is the problem here? Is it really a legal problem or is it an educational problem? Um, <coughs> As I said, there are two models. You can either have a law practice uh, doing your uh, work for you, or you can operate a mutual insurance fund uh, and pay lawyers as you need them, uh, which can be horribly expensive. Now, the place for legal action. A lot of people, certainly in my country, I don't know, uh, it is said that in America people are litigatious um, and that they like to go to court at the drop of a hat. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but in my country it is certainly not true. Uh, in our country it's uh, quite a shameful thing to, to get into court, so people tend to avoid it as far as they possibly can. So, uh, a lot of the time we're questioned and said, yeah, but we must uh, uh, discuss these things and, and uh, come to amicable agreements and so on and so forth. Um, that only works to a certain extent. And the reason for that lies in a definition that General von Clausewitz gave for war in the 19th century. He said, war is a continuation of diplomacy by other means. It's not the opposite of diplomacy. It's the same thing continued by other means. And the simple fact is that a country can be as diplomatic as it likes and uh, be as friendly on the international stage as it likes if it doesn't have an army and a navy to back up the diplomats nobody will take any notice of it and that unfortunately is the situation in which many homeschoolers find themselves around the world they're trying to uh, deal with the uh, 
authorities and do so on a basis of uh, mutual respect, uh, uh, understanding, etc., 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 but they have nothing behind them to remind the authorities that if they don't respect on their part, then the courts can be brought in to teach them respect. So we do need that those teeth in order to make our diplomacy successful. <coughs> the next question then is, do we follow an offensive or a defensive approach to the uh, authorities or to authority in general? and so on and so forth. In other words, now that we have our teeth, do we go, go about biting left, right and center? Um, or do we sit back and try and hide uh, until it's necessary? Um, there again, my naval background comes in. Uh, it is, there's a rough rule of thumb in strategy that if you use an offensive uh, approach, you can expect to need four to seven times as many troops and resources in order to succeed uh, compared with when you are using a uh, defensive approach. That it tells you immediately if you're small and weak, defensive is the way to go. And homeschoolers are actually very good on the defensive. In fact, the top uh, form of defensive warfare is probably guerrilla warfare. Um, and in the legal scenario, the opposite or the, the argument is that if you go out and you make, uh, uh, you sue the government for all the bad policies that they have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, your burden of proof is higher. You have to prove in most legal systems, you have to prove on balance of probability that your case is correct. In most uh, legal systems, if you are actually accused of a crime, then the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a much higher burden of proof, which means they need more resources in order to get you convicted than to win the case if you are taking them to court. Um, the advantage of the offensive, it gives you the opportunity to choose the battlefield, which means it can be very important uh, because it means that you choose the case that you're going to fight. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't choose it in the defensive. It just, just becomes much more difficult. Um, and I use this little video just to illustrate the nature of uh, homeschooling, uh, it doesn't video, but you get the idea, quails in the tall grass uh, is what homeschoolers can be like when they're on the defensive. So homeschoolers can be invisible, which is an advantage in the defensive, and you always have the advantage of bureaucratic inertia. Government actually has to take do, to do a great deal of work to get to the point where they start attacking you and, and uh, uh, harassing you and so on and so forth. Because by nature, bureaucracy is static. Uh, <clears throat> 
And if you're taking a defensive uh, position, that uh, inertia actually works for you. So, the last question is the problem of the teeth. Is it primarily legal or is it primarily educational? Now, in some cases, it's obviously a legal case. Um, please turn up and arrest the father or something like that. But if we look at it, if we're looking at it on a strategic uh, level, jurisprudence comprises of applying the law to the, to the facts. Now, the facts in home education are facts of education. And that means that one needs to understand what education is. And we need to have a good knowledge of the educational and psychological uh, significant things in home education. And the first thing you come to then is that home education is individualized education. Um, in other words, the law must be applied to the educational and psychological facts related to each child individually. That does not mean that general uh, scientific results, such as homeschoolers perform on the 80th percentile, are not useful. In fact, they are the basis. But I think we're getting to the stage where the courts are now, certainly in our part of the world, and it seems to me in Europe, looking beyond uh, the, the, the general. And they starting to ask, but uh, what is the effect of home education on the individual? Um, and therefore, homeschoolers must challenge policies that are founded on generalized assumptions. Policies that are founded on generalized assumptions. Government policies. And so a rights-based strategy will defend the rights of parents to provide each child with that education that is in the best interest of that individual child given the unique personality and circumstances of the child. And conversely, it will defend the right of the child to having these decisions made by the parents, being the persons closest to the child and who know the child best, what is in Europe known as the principle of subsidiarity. Um, the point being, that the relational aspects of education, the child's relationship to its parents, uh, is being recognized progressively as probably the, the strongest factor in determining educational success. And that is what we are basing our long-term strategy on, is that the law and the courts must protect that relationship, uh, irrespective of what government would like to do in a country like ours, where they tell us explicitly that they want to use the education system to create uniform citizens. Thank you, Gerald. 
Thank you, Leendert. Is there any questions for Leendert? At the back. I'll get... Uh, Gracias, buen día a todas y a todos. Nuevamente gracias por este encuentro. Eh, no sé si, si entendí suficientemente bien, pero pareciera ser que hay una coincidencia entre lo que usted está diciendo, profesor, y nuestro trabajo de investigación de varios años en Colombia y en otros países de Latinoamérica, en el sentido de que uno de los principales problemas ¿Está traduciendo? Pero, ¿Está traduciendo? Pero ellos no están oyendo. Ella puede traducir el ¿Tú quieres traducir? Bueno, otra vez entonces. Ok. Sí, pero ellos no tienen, no tienen diadema. Ellos no tienen. Use this one, I can speak very loudly. No, no está bien. Uh, For no, uh, the Ella traduce, ella puede no, traducir. Sí. Sí. Eh, nuevamente, gracias. Eh, profe, parece… Gracias. Again, thank you again for this space. And it, it seems to me that what you're saying is… Eh, muchas gracias, profesor, por sus ideas. Sí, 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 continúe. Eh, parece ser que hay una coincidencia, si he entendido bien, entre lo que usted está diciendo y el trabajo de investigación que vinimos haciendo hace varios años en Colombia y en algunos otros lugares de Latinoamérica. It seems to me that what you're speaking is very similar to the investigation work that we've been doing in Latin America and in Colombia especially. Al parecer, uno de los principales problemas de las familias y de las comunidades que educan sin escuela and schooling. Apparently one of the greatest problems of people that are doing homeschooling and unschooling es el miedo a ejercer su derecho a la libre educación. El miedo a ejercer su derecho a la libre educación. Is there fear of exercising their right of free education? Gracias. Thank you. Uh, gracias, señor. Um, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Uh, the fear engendered by uh, official pressure and the power that officialdom has to make matters difficult for individuals the that's not correct um let me co continue on that uh, along that line um m our experience has been that this is the function of having the teeth behind the parents is really to give them the um the courage to exercise their own rights and to protect the rights of their children. This is the one aspect. The other aspect is knowledge. The knowledge that they can do the best for their children and why they can do the best for their children. And that even applies whether they send the child to a school or not. The parent is the only one who can make that decision because the parent is the only one who knows the child uh, well enough. And then, which school to send the child to? But in the end, that is the function of a legal or, uh, advocacy organization, is to give the parents in society that courage to, um, to really uh, exercise the rights which in most countries today exists in law, if not in practice. Thank you, Leander. We'll come back with some more questions later. Um, so I think what we'll do is move on to our, our next presenter.
uh, which is Mike Donnelly. Uh, Mike is, uh, thank you, Leander. Uh, Mike is uh, a staff attorney with uh, Homeschool Legal Defense Association in the United States. Uh, Mike uh, is responsible for um, for representing uh, or dealing with the legal issues in in eight eight of the states and uh, and internationally uh, as the global outreach director for HSLDA. So. Um, Mike, uh, glad you're here to uh, to talk about uh, the uh, the experience of legal advocacy in the United States uh, and uh, what we can uh, what we can learn uh, and uh, and learn go forward. So, thank you, Gerald. I want to thank Gerald, who's the chairman of our organizing board, and all the board members who are here. If you're a board member, could you raise your hand? If you're a board member for the group, okay. So I just want to thank the board. They've been working very hard for the last, uh, we've all been working very hard for the last couple of years. Yeah, okay, great, good, thank you. Just give me, give me a moment. So I thought what I would do um, is uh, just take you on a little tour. We'll just see if this works. Okay. Okay, so, sorry. Hi. <laughs> uh, you know, as Gerald said, I'm a staff attorney with HSLDA, Director for Global Outreach. At HSLDA, we have a legal staff of about 12, 13 lawyers, maybe 14 lawyers on staff. HSLDA is an organization of between s about 75 full-time staff members. Our legal, our lawyers, we have about 14 lawyers throughout the organization. That's 14 too many lawyers for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, but uh, we also have legal assistance. So our legal staff is probably 20, 21, 22 people, which is almost a quarter of our organization. So that should tell you that while we do a lot of legal stuff, it's not the only thing that we do, but we're here to talk about uh, the legal advocacy. And legal advocacy is the most important thing that we do. It's why people join HSLDA. Uh, they join us because they feel that there is a need to protect their family from intrusion from the state. Uh, there are other reasons to join HSLDA because we do other things, but that's the main reason. Um, in the early days of home education in the United States, families were at risk of truancy prosecution. Uh, they were at risk of having their children removed from their custody because of truancy or because the authorities thought that uh, homeschooling was educational neglect. Uh, and so we talked about this yesterday. You know, the need was f to defend homeschooling families. So, you know, HSLDA started with just a couple of lawyers, not even together. They were, one was in California, one was in Washington, D.C., and they just worked remotely, which was really hard back in the 80s. No internet. <laughs> Telephone. I mean, fax machines were a new thing. Okay, fax machines were like amazing at the time, right? Now we just push a button and we send megabytes of information. Uh, at any rate, and then, you know, as, as homeschooling grew in the 80s, there were more conflicts between uh, homeschooling families and the authorities. You know, you heard Davis say yesterday, conflict will happen, but combat is optional. Well, combat was not optional. Okay, in that situation, there were families that needed to be defended. We had to fight for these families in court. And so as HSLD grew, we added staff. And our, the biggest battle we had was in courts, but also in the legislature. And we're going to talk about lobbying in the next session. Is that right? Yeah, so we'll, we'll save that for then. 
And and so it took a while through courts and legislative activity to get homeschooling legal. Uh, you know, and it's been legal in the United States for, in all states, for about 20 years, since 1996 was the last time, uh, was the last state, Michigan, to pass a law uh, recognizing homeschooling in the law. We would say that it was always con our constitutional right, uh, but sometimes you have your right and you don't get it. That's a, that's a European thing, uh, also an American thing. Okay, so when we talk about fighting for families, what's our model? We have, 14, we have 21 legal staff. What do we do? We have two groups within our organization, and if you're looking to start a national organization with legal as part of it, here is just a, something to consider. What we, so our number one goal is to keep things out of court, if possible. Because when you go to court, nobody really wins. I mean, you can win, and we do win. We win a lot. We usually win. We didn't usually win. We usually lost back in the old days. We lost a lot more than we won. And court was a delay tactic in, in a lot of cases. Today, we, when we go to court, we win. But if you can keep things out of court, that's the best situation, usually. Okay, today. If, I mean, if you're fighting for the right and you want it to be legalized, then you want to go to court. That's a different strategy. Today in the U.S., where homeschooling is recognized, we're trying to keep things out of court. And so we have five or six attorneys and legal staff whose job, and that's one of my jobs, is to keep things out of court, to try to handle things at the lowest level possible with the authorities to resolve misunderstandings or conflict with letters or phone calls. And so that's what we do. So we try to keep things out of court. So I send hundreds and hundreds of letters a year to school authorities. Now these are not nice letters. These are not, hi, how are you, nice to meet you letters. These are very firm lawyer letters that say, you better leave this family alone or we will sue you. <laughs> okay, so we, th we use court, we threaten court uh, to try to keep things out of court. And most of the time, it, it's it, it's effective. We're able to keep things out of court. So that's our model of, of trying to manage legal conflict. Sometimes, though, you have to go to court. And so you need to have lawyers who are skilled in litigation. And litigation is a, ver is a specialized skill. Um, and so we actually have a group of lawyers whose job is simply litigation. We have three lawyers. All they do is, mostly what they do is litigation. They deal with situations where we've, you know, either we couldn't keep it out of court or there's no way to keep it out of court and we're there. Um, and so we, you know, when you're looking at going to court, you have to assess why you're in court. What's your purpose in court? Are you there to defend a family? That's one reason you might find yourself in court. The other reason, and that's a defensive approach. The other reason you might find yourself in court, and we, in the early days of HSLDA, we were in court for this reason, was because of an offensive strategy, okay? The court was a, a forum where we could affect change, um, either taking a case up to the Supreme Court and getting them to declare a law unconstitutional, as we did in several cases, in different states, uh, or to make a big deal about a situation to get the attention of the legislature and say, look at this problem here, you guys better fix this. And so that's an offensive approach to using the court. And we, and we did that and we, we, try, we still do that, although we try to avoid it if, if possible. As I said, we try to resolve as much as possible outside of a court context. Why? Well, court is expensive. It's very expensive. Uh, it's also high risk. When you go to court, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you think you know, you hope you know, but as a lawyer, any, any good lawyer will tell you, look, here's what the law says, here's what I think is gonna happen, here's what should happen, but then you have the variable, the judge. <laughs> you never know what the judge is gonna do. And judges, unfortunately, have a lot of power, probably more power than they should, I think so, uh, and you just cannot know what they're going to do. They can 
agree with you. They could disagree with you. And if you're in a, with a jury, I mean, some lawyers would say, give me a jury any day, <laughs> you know, of, of your peers and in some cases and, you know, let the jury decide. But that's still a variable because they, it's somebody else deciding what the facts are and, and what's the outcome. So and anyway, so, so they will say, you know, here's what I think will happen, but you never know. You could lose. And, you know, that you just have to take that into consideration. So, so you know, again, offensive strategy, defensive strategy. Uh, and sometimes they can be used for the same thing. You know, you may find yourself in court defending a family, but you may see an opportunity to con turn that case into a case that can be used. When you're using court offensively, you have to be very careful in how you select your cases. You have to have very clean cases. You need cases where there are not a lot of distractions. Okay, now you can't always, you, you know, you're never going to find a perfect client, although we had a, have had a couple of them, like the Romica family, uh, the Germans who came over from, the, from Germany in 2008. We represented them in immigration court. This is about as beautiful, clean, family you could ever I mean a normal family all they wanted to do was homeschool in Germany and the authorities said forget it no way and they said we got to get out of here and they came to the United States and we represented them beautiful family uh, you know your clients are not always going to look like that <laughs> so you have to be willing to assess whether that's a problem or not when you're looking at these cases in your countries okay uh, and you you know you may say, well, it's too important an issue, we've got to take it to court, even though there are these problems, and you try to deal with those problems. There may be problems in the family, there may be other issues that need to be addressed. Even though you want to focus on this one issue of home education, there may be other issues involved, and you try to deal with those and get them out of the way so that you can focus on the home education issue. So, we talk about legal advocacy in court. Courts can be used for offensive, defensive, um, we try and keep things out of court. But even today, homeschooling has been going on in the U.S. Uh, for 60 years. You can go back to 1950. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it actually, it's been happening longer. You go back to one of the earliest homeschooling cases in the United States, which was in New Hampshire in 1929. Uh, and then 1950, you have Illinois, a court case, Supreme Court case. These are significant cases. 1950, Illinois. Still not very many people doing it, but you can see that it was happening because you have these cases. Uh, then you move into the 70s, and more and more people are beginning to do it, and then you have more and more cases, more Supreme Court cases showing that there's more interest, and then the, the movement is growing. Uh, we've never had a case go to the Supreme Court of the United States on just on homeschooling. So, you know, homeschooling has been going on for a long time, uh, and uh, at any rate, so... Okay, so that's, so that's kind of how HSLDA's strategy is right now. How am I doing on time? Eight minutes, okay. All right, so that's, that's, how we're, that's how HSLDA is structured. We have our attorneys that try to resolve things. We have our litigation attorneys. We talked about litigation how when you go to court, it can be defensive or offensive. We talked about some of those issues. Um, I want to talk a little bit about today about some of the things that we do uh, and point out a couple of examples here. Um, so this is the HSLDA website. I think this gives you a nice window into how we're organized as, a, as, a, um, as an organization. And uh, the big place where a lot of people will go um, you know, we, now the other, okay, so in the, U, the U.S. is a, re, a republic, we have federal and we have state, and education is mostly at the state level. I recognize that in a number of your countries, education is a national level issue. Um, and so you will have to address national level policy. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the lobbying section. But... Uh, right now, where people go on our site a lot is to the my state part, which is, you know, we have 50 states, uh, and we have a summary of laws. I'm going to go to my home state of West Virginia here. And so people can come here, and we're working on our website. It's We know we need to work on it. <laughs> it's a little 
info intensive, but um, but you go to you go to your state page. So this is the state of West Virginia. There are ten thousand homeschooling families in West Virginia, uh, give or take. Um, and on any given day, I'm getting a phone call from someone in West Virginia saying I'm being hassled by the government, the schools, and you know. So here they will get information. They can learn how to comply with the law, but we also use this page to inform people. So. I'll talk about this a little bit in the next session, too, because we just passed a law improving the situation in West Virginia dramatically. But here's an example of some of the things we do. Okay, and I write stories about the things we're doing to let our members know that, hey, you know, there are things happening in your state. And we do this for two reasons. And if you're starting an organization in your state, you can use legal situations to inform people about what you're doing which should create, well, for those who are members of your association like ours, um, loyalty, appreciation. It's like, man, I'm glad you guys are there to defend me. You're defending this person. If that happened to me, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad to know that I've got a, somebody I can call if I have a problem. Okay, and so we're letting them know about that and uh, reminding them that <laughs> there's still people who want to hassle homeschoolers, even in today's day and age, okay? Um, and hopefully, you know, we also have a lot of people who are not members of our association on our list, and we're trying to get their attention to say, hey, look, what happened to these people? You, you know, if you're not a member of HSLDA and this happens to you, who are you going to call? Because there's no Ghostbusters, right? <laughs> My American friends got that. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the Ghostbusters, okay? So here's an example. Um, I'm here to investigate unsocialized homeschoolers, okay? So this was a story I wrote. We created this fun little graphic, and we put this on Facebook, um, and we got, let's see here, 12,300 shares on Facebook, which seems like a pretty good number. It's a lot, a large number. Um, and, uh, and so this means it was a story that got around. A lot of people were like, whoa, what's this all about? I mean, un when you put the words unsocialized homeschoolers together, you're putting a red flag in front of a bull. You know, this is one of those issues that homeschoolers are like, oh, are we talking about unsocialized homeschoolers again? You've got to be kidding me. This is 2016. We have 2 million homeschooled children in the United States, and we're still talking about unsocialized homeschoolers. We will be talking about unsocialized homeschoolers until there are no public schools, okay? Um, and even then, somebody will be talking about it. So, so this was a story that I wrote. It was about a, a situation where a social worker knocked on a family's door, and they actually said, I'm here to investigate unsocialized homeschoolers. Well, who told them that there were unsocialized homeschoolers in this house? Uh, it was their neighbor. Because this is something that we do as well. And when you think about it, when, if you're thinking about starting a legal organization, you're going to deal with a, authorities in a lot of different areas. It's not just court. In fact, you, let's hope, it, again, it's not mostly court, okay, because you don't want to go to court. Um, so you need to be able to deal with a lot of different authorities. Social workers, case workers in the child protection system is one of those group of authority figures that you're going to have to deal with. We deal with them all the time. Truancy officers also, superintendents, okay? So that was a quick four minutes. Man, I'll tell you, time flies. Okay, so, so anyway, so, so they came and they made this accusation and uh, we, we dealt with it because that's ridiculous. That's not a legitimate allegation, period. Um, and, the, so, and, you know, and so you'll find that authorities can be reasonable or unreasonable. And so when you have an organization, you hire a lawyer or you are a lawyer, you've got to have different ways of dealing with different situations. And I guess that's the point I'll make and try to wrap up here is, um, you know, the legal, legal defense is extremely important for the homeschooling community. It is uh, a primary function that needs to be served in any country or any jurisdiction. And it's a, it's a very legitimate function for a national organization to, to provide, especially if you're in a country where it's a national law. If you're in a republic, you may need to have subgroups and, or have con we have contacts with attorneys throughout all 50 states. If we need to work with someone, we can call them. So those are some of the things you need to think about. You want to have relationships with other attorneys 
Um, and if you don't have an attorney who's part of your organization, then you can have a relationship with one who maybe is fam who is um, sympathetic to homeschooling, um, so that they gain the skill set. Because there's, a, as Paul said yesterday, there's a very specific skill set related to uh, defending homeschooling cases. So you have a lot of uh, different authority figures to deal with, and sometimes you want to resolve things. You have to have negotiation skills. So you know when you're when you're thinking about your organization and forming a legal component of it you want to have somebody not just somebody who's who's who who just wants to fight because if you've got someone who's pugnacious aggressive as a litigator you're going to go to court too much and if you go to court too much you lose too much and there's too much at stake in this movement to to go to court without having the best possible case so um I've given you kind of a, 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 a real tour here of a lot of different things to think about. When you think about legal, uh, legal organization, I'll be happy to speak with uh, any of you individually about your own situation. I deal with, I've dealt with a lot of your countries. Uh, I also do international legal advocacy. That's something that I do. I'm a, I do litigate internationally some, um, so I kind of do a lot of those different things. But, uh, but nationally, my main job in the US is resolving conflict. Uh, and so I would encourage you, as you're starting your national organization, you're thinking about legal functions, think about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll, uh, we'll save the questions to the end. Uh, next, uh, Paul Ferris. Uh, Paul is uh, with HSLDA Canada. Uh, Paul is a lawyer, uh, has uh, uh, worked in cases uh, in provinces as well as before the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, uh, Paul is a homeschool graduate, married to a homeschool graduate, homeschool dad of four. I was trying to, I knew it was more than, more than three. And um, Paul, I'll uh, ask you to share the experience. What we've got is sort of a, a just a little a diversity. You know, we've got the 70 staff that HSLDA has in the U.S. and the much smaller number that we have in Canada. So to give you a perspective on sort of organizational differences. So, Paul. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, just want to reiterate what was said by the previous two uh, presenters, Mike and Leander. Excellent stuff. So I'm not going to say the same things they've said. I'm going to add on to that. And... Um, want to start out with a little bit of strategy on this because it's so when you understand the law at the basic level you just understand law but what you realize at a certain point is that law is something that is used to fulfill a strategy if you don't have a strategy how can you use the law so just really really quickly when you're starting an organization or building an organization, you need to think about a few things. One, think really hard about what you need and build a model that will accomplish those goals. So how will you finance your effort? You know, you can't change the world if you can't pay the rent, right? Anyone who's worked in advocacy in any ways comes up against that reality at a certain point. If you can't eat, you can't do a lot of good work. How will you build grassroots support? That's incredibly important. It's easy to go and say, I speak for homeschoolers, but if there's no homeschoolers behind you, no one's going to listen to you. How will you gain sympathy for your movement? How will you convince the culture in which you live that what you're doing is a good thing? That's essential. What are you trying to accomplish over the next 20 years? Where do you want to be in 20 years? And you have to understand your own country and the homeschoolers in it, or at least those you hope will homeschool. So, so what demographic are you trying to reach and convert or serve or whatever? Uh, these are all really important for the legal strategy you plug in and whether you even have a legal department. I think you probably need one. Says the lawyer. Um, Exactly. There's something dysfunctional about having a session run by three lawyers. I don't know. Well, Lean Dirt's an honorary lawyer. I mean, he, he uh, knows more about homeschooling than most lawyers. Uh, it is very, very specialized, what we do. The model in Canada, we have, I just wrote this down, we have one full-time lawyer, that's me. 
we have one part-time lawyer who works with me and then as Leandert was talking, I do think it's important and valuable. I mean, even at the size the states is, they still work with local legal experts because it's home court advantage, right? The lawyer who's in that court every day or has specialization, even with 14 lawyers, you can't be an expert in everything. So, but it's also very important to have someone in an office who understands homeschooling and understands the strategy. So, uh, just to pick up on a couple of themes that were said in this, the, uh, what you really want to do, and, and the approach I take is, I believe that homeschooling, home education, is a societal good that parents have the right to practice under international law, under natural law. I'm, I personally would be a natural law theorist. Um, we have the right to homeschool. As parents, we have the the right to educate our children. And practically, parents are the ones who are in the best position to raise and educate their children. As a historian or an honorary historian, I look through history, I only see one model that works for raising effective citizens. And that is parents raising their children. Any other models that work, it's because they're imitating that model in some way. They're, you know, fostering or adopting. It's, it's an imitation and a, a request or a, an effort to imitate that model. So what we're doing is we're protecting what works and then bringing into that into the education field, right? And I say that because a lot of people in different areas say, oh, you know, this law says this or this law says that. And, and I say, and hear me when I say this, but my goal as a lawyer who defends homeschoolers is not to perfectly interpret the law. My goal as a lawyer who represents homeschoolers is to interpret the law and to a certain extent use the law in order to ensure that the rights of parents are recognized in our legal system. So this is partially where lawyers get a bad reputation. You know, when you ask them, what does the law say? They say, well, what do you want it to say and how much money do you have, right? <laughs> right? So let's, let's redeem that reputation and use those methods for a good cause, which is homeschooling. And so our job is to go into, uh, homeschooling is regulated at a provincial level. So we have 10 provinces in Canada. Each one has a different law on homeschooling. We look at all of those and we say, you know, what does the Constitution say? What does international law say? What's the legislation of the country? What does the regulation say? Uh, and then what's the policy at the provincial level? And then what's the policy at the school board level? And we use all those things collectively to achieve the best results for homeschoolers in that region. And the strategy is very long term. So when we look at it and we analyze it, we'll say, okay, so Right now, this is what the law says. This is the practice in this province. This is what we want it to be. And then we engage a strategy that keeps it from getting worse and then seeks to make it better over the long term. So uh, the next session is on political advocacy. Uh, that can be very valuable, so building relationships with politicians, you get a new government in place and they're perhaps friendly to families or friendly to a diversity in education. So you might look at making a change in the law under that government. If the next government, four years later, isn't friendly to homeschooling, you're not going to try to change anything. You're just going to very quietly, like Lean Dern said, hide in the grass and hope that that government that's naturally unfavorable to you won't even notice you or make any changes. Uh, if there is a, you can have a good law in a province and a bad policy that interprets that in a very bad way. You can have a bad law and a good policy that interprets that in a very good way. And so when legal change comes in, what we try to do is you get the best legislation you can and then after you get legislation, there's usually enabling regulations that come out, at least under our Canadian legal system. So you work to get the best regulation you can. And every level helps you get better 
things below it. So after the regulation comes out, the Ministry of Education in the province will introduce a policy usually. You work to get the best policy you can. And then the local school districts and school boards will usually have their own policies interpreting that policy, interpreting the regulation, interpreting the legislation. Sorry, I'm speaking too fast. And you try to get the best one there you can. So it's really a strategy, and that's what a head office can really do, is develop that long-term strategy to get the best result. And under that strategy, you might choose to fight a legal case in one jurisdiction because there's bad law and things are being introduced, and as you've worked for change or you've worked to keep it the same, you just can't get any traction, so you have to take a case to court in order to get a better law or to force them to change some part of the legislation or policy or whatever. But which way you go on that, it's, it's very important to have all your strategies available. And then you choose the best one that's gonna produce the best results for the people you represent. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, but in doing that, it's very important to have the ability to fight a court case because just having that ability gives you a lot more uh, clout at the bargaining table, as Leandert had said. It, teeth, it gives you teeth. So when I was a young uh, lawyer starting out, I, I did corporate litigation, which is basically companies fighting each other in court, and was at a large litigation firm. And one of the senior lawyers who was a top litigator in the country uh, told me this, and hopefully this doesn't sound too aggressive, but he said, you know, early in your career, and this is, you know, fighting for big companies, he said, early in your career, take an impossible case, take an unreasonable position on that case, and fight it all the way through as hard as you can right to the end, knowing you'll lose, because after that, people will fear you and know you're a little bit unreasonable. And so when you sit down at the bargaining table with them, they will make sure to pay attention to you and talk because they know at any moment you might just decide you're going to fight unreasonably. And then they're going to have to go to court because the reality is no one wants to go to court because it's a massive risk. No lawyer knows what a judge is going to say. It doesn't ma I don't care what the law says. No one knows what a judge is going to say. So every time you go to court, you take a risk. And you've got to assess that risk in light of how much you can gain and how much you can lose. Sometimes if, if they're passing a law that will basically shut down homeschooling, you have no choice and you have to fight it in court. But if you can win without having to go to court, that's the better, that's the true win. Um, to quote another military example, Sun Tzu basically said, you know, the greatest general doesn't have to fight, right? Uh, so the other thing is, if we're, um, and again, this is verging into the next session, but it all works together at a strategy level. The best thing I like to do is get to know wh whoever the official is, you know, whether it's the John Shaw department in Manitoba, which is, used to be one guy who basically regulated homeschooling in the entire province or whether it's at individual school boards, you wanna to get to know those people and help them understand the good of homeschooling, help them understand how it works, and say, let's work together as partners to ensure the success of the education of all these children under you know, your power. That doesn't always work, and the legal department comes in, but if they respect you and know that your organization is willing to cause them a lot of problems because no person who works for government wants to go to court. It's a hassle for them. It's a lot of extra paperwork and red tape and costs for the department. I've never met one who wants to go to court. So if they know that you might go to court against them, they're gonna negotiate with you and work with you in much better faith. A, a quick word because we don't have much time on how you represent. There's a lot of organizations outside the homeschooling model that 
basically what they do is they don't represent individual families. They represent a position. And so they wait until a case has gone to court, something's happened, and then it's been appealed, and then they intervene at a higher court and make legal arguments and try to get a legal position changed. That's valuable. I think the more valuable thing we're able to do as a legal organization is to help families in the individual circumstances. So most of the legal work we do is dealing with the very first instance when a family interacts with someone, whether it's a principal of a school or someone in the education department, whoever that family is, is dealing with, we actually have the forms they're supposed to fill out to homeschool right on our website. So one, we make sure they get the right form because some places you call and say, how do I homeschool? They'll tell you completely wrong things. So making sure families have good information and then helping the family do that, fill that out properly. And then when whoever that official is gets back to them, sometimes they'll approve it and say that's fine or receive the form or whatever it is. But sometimes they'll say, oh no, you also need to fill out this form. And they're wrong. But telling the family what they have to do so that they don't do more than they need to is very important. And